today we are going to discuss paper 2 of economics optional right so hello everyone a very good afternoon today we are going to discuss paper 2 of economics optional right so what i am going to do is see as you all know that this is optional paper and you have to present your answers in 150 250 and so on in these many words so it will really be incompatible for me to elaborately present each and every answer so rather what i'll try to do is i'll give the key points of each and every answer and i'll tell you the, that how you could have presented the answer what would have been the most appropriate way to score marks right so let's get started Question number one. Just a minute. <clears throat> so in question number one, it is saying that land system during the British rule was responsible for sustained poverty and stagnant growth in India. And we are required to comment on it. Okay. So, in question number one, we have to comment that land system during the British era was responsible for sustained poverty. So, how? So, see, there are few features or few salient points of it that can be presented. 1A. So, we could have written that impact of land system during British era in India is a complex issue is a complex issue amongst historian fine so this is the introduction phase you could give a bit of introduction that is in a line or two the introduction then you could directly jump to the points that the key points regarding land system during British rule. So the point like land revenue system impact on agriculture by British policies third is commercialization of agriculture in commercialized and see these are the key points that i am telling you one one two two lines in each of the every point would have been more than sufficient for example in commercialization of agriculture you could write that britishers they were using India as the supplier of raw material. So what they encouraged was they encouraged the growth or the production of such goods which serve as raw material for British industries, right? That's what they did. They propagated the production of commercial crops. Okay, that's what commercialization of agriculture means. Then infrastructure development, there was a sort of infrastructure development too in the British area era. But the thing is that development was not for the benefit of India. For example, introduction of trains in India, it was done with the sole purpose of transfer of goods and to crush any mutiny that developed in India. So that 
the raw materials could easily be transferred from the farms to the ports or shipyards and then they can be shipped back to Britain. So that's what the purpose was. Then you can say that industrialization also flourished. Okay, and due to these policies of British, a bit of explanation on poverty. So these key points, if you will represent, or these key points, if you will present in your answer, you would have presented in your answer, you will get good marks in this question. Okay, moving on. Next is, how did VKRB Rao improve upon the earlier national income estimates of India. That means they are talking about the contribution of VKRB Rao. So see, you could have said that VKRB Rao, the way in which you could have started your answer or the best approach would have been that you first of all introduce that who was VKRB Rao. So you could have said that he was a prominent Indian economist and he made significant contribution in improving the national income okay basically national income estimates during his tenure as the chairman of national income committee in late 1940s right his work in the area aimed to provide more accurate and comprehensive assessment of now there are several things or several areas under which he worked let us see what those areas are. So areas like number one, this is B part, data collection. Okay. Second, sectoral breakdown of the economy. He broke down the economy into sectors so that it could be easier for planning purposes. Then use of advanced technologies. Then you have integration of regional data. See guys, the regional data was not available okay, at dispose. So what VKRV Rao did was he made significant efforts to collect the regional data to see that what is the ratio or how much land is owned by a particular farmer. What's the average land holding capacity of a farmer? All these data, they were quite essential for the planning purpose and VKRV Rao played a significant role in it. So integration that is combination of regional data Okay, then income distribution analysis, how the income is distributed, this analysis was also done by him, historical data, policy implications, so all these are the major steps taken by BK R. V. Rao. Understood? So a bit of introduction about VK R. V. Rao that who he was, right? And then highlighting these efforts that he made, it would have been more than significant. Understood? Okay. Moving on. So these are the points. Next question. So the question is examine C part of first question. Examine the impacts of green revolution on production and productivity in the agriculture sector. So see guys, till now we have observed we are still in the third question. But the questions are quite repetitive. What I mean by repetitive, that past year questions, these three questions, anyone who has taken economics optional, 
he or she knows that these are the topics important topics from paper 2 and every year you get a question from them so the same trend has been followed this time there hasn't been any change and the similar question popular question is the word are asked okay green revolution how green revolution affected now first of all you could begin by saying that green revolution let me write it okay so c part you could say that green revolution which began in 1960 right had had a profound impact on production and productivity obviously in agricultural sector in india okay and what happened in this period so this could have been framed in the second point that this period marked a significant shift in agricultural practices and what those shifts were so adoption of high yielding crops or high yielding seed high yielding crop varieties and this was guys a major effect a major impact of green revolution that high yielding crop varieties were adopted increased use of fertilizers and pesticides and then improved irrigation techniques so these are few major impacts of green revolution okay and what all by adopting these measures in green revolution what the result was or what was the impact of it this you could represent in points like uh, economic crisis was resolved to some extent okay and then your agriculture's self sustainability in agriculture was achieved so these two three points etc you can write as impact and your answer is complete fine understood moving on fourth question it says that declaration and structural retrogression have been the key features of industrial sector in india during 1965 and 1980 so declaration and retrogression okay so during the direct question from the industrial sector of 1965 and 1980 so see so there are several heads under which this answer could be presented i am just stating out the heads and you could describe these heads and your answer will be complete so first is 
you see the economic crisis number 2 license raj and bureaucratic hurdles okay then energy shortages slow industrial growth external shock and then political instability so under these six points you could describe the impacts getting me that would give you a complete answer understood right okay easy question <clears throat> moving on next question is examine the factors responsible for acceleration in the growth of national income in the decade of 1980s as against 1960 and 1970 so what the question is asking us that there was acceleration okay in the growth of national income so what were the factors that accelerated the national income in 1980s in comparison to 1960s and 70s that's what we have to tell in this answer so let us see so i am writing several factors and you could you could have explain these factors for the complete answer so factors like economic reforms and liberalization second increased industrialization okay then technology and innovation export oriented growth agricultural reforms services or service sector boom global factors political stability improved infrastructure and logistics so these are several points which could have been illustrated in economic reforms you could write that the different reforms that were taken in the period of 80s liberalization policy followed by government increased industrialization industrialization got a push from government side and industries the number of industries also increased considerably technology and innovation the era was of innovation new technologies were introduced in the market these also led to the growth export oriented growth now people or companies local companies domestic companies they started exporting the indian products outside thereby fetching the foreign income agricultural reforms already discussed green revolution so this is post green revolution era so now the fruits of green revolution 
what tasted in this era so that also gave the push in the economy then service sector boom a new sector evolved and that is the service sector and it got a high boom in this period global factors certain global factors you could mention then political stability this was the time of political stability indira gandhi was the prime minister and improved infrastructure uh, attention was also laid on improving the infrastructure of the country this also led to the growth understood so these are the several points that were or several factors that led to the growth understood okay moving on next question is it says explain the main features of money and credit policies in india during the independence era okay it is asking you that what were the features of money and credit policy money and credit policy in india during pre independence era pre independence we did not get independence as of that time okay so let us see how we could have represented the answer this is second question a part see guys during pre independence era the credit system money control system was very complex and it was fragmented there was no central authority to govern the system so the system was fragmented and it was very complex due to this fragmentization okay so a bit of introduction of it that complex and fragmented monetary and credit system characterized by a mix of traditional practices okay and lack of uniformity of currency this is important point that there was no uniform currency even uniformity of currency then several aspects are here that can be illustrated like barter system okay a bit of explanation of it then heterogeneous currency as i told you no uniform currency was prevalent heterogeneous different states different regions using different forms of currency right then commodity money indigenous banking indigenous banking no proper banking system in fact indigenous banking that means as of now we use checks and all at that time hundis were used okay the proper explanation of this in our regular classes we have given agricultural credit so farmers faced tremendous amount of problems and issues in acquiring agricultural credits to strengthen their growth process hmm to implant different crops they needed money and there was no proper or formal scenario of agricultural credit so they faced several problems they borrowed the money from the local money lenders and this money was given out or 
lended out at high rate of interest so farmers were not able to pay out the money the interest rate was so high that forget about the principal farmers were not even able to pay out the interest of that principal so this was a huge problem then limited access to credit as i told you since there was no central banking authority so indigenous banking practices were there so credit was not a thing that could be acquired by everyone limited access to credit okay then zamindars were also prevalent at that time zamindar system or role of zamindars and then you can write no central bank no central banking authority so all these were the features of pre independence economy and this is more than sufficient it will fetch you good marks okay moving on b is what are the factors contributing towards shifting sectoral composition in gross national product that is gnp in india during the pre economic reform period and we have to discuss it okay so i'm writing the points that were required several aspects are there i'm just writing the aspects and you could explain these aspects and you will get good marks just a minute so these aspects could have been explained to score nice marks huh what are the aspects like uh, first of all historical legacy agricultural dominance just a minute please hmm right the agricultural dominance three industrial development then public sector dominance agricultural reforms service sector growth trade policies labor force dynamics and income disparities i have illustrated all of them all are not even required you have to answer accordingly so under these heads you could explain okay next question c explain the main reasons for declaration in agricultural growth in india during the post economic reform period c now the question is asking that after the economic reforms that is the reforms of 1991 1992 known as 
liberalization privatization globalization lpg reforms very famous and important so post economic reforms that means after this these reforms were made after these reforms what was the impact on agriculture so we all know that agriculture got declarated so why agriculture got declarated that's what the question is hmm. that's what we are required to explain that what were the reasons for the declaration in agricultural growth in india during post economic reform period and we have to discuss this that why have what happened and why it happened okay so let us see so there are several reasons why agriculture got declarated what are the factors which led to the declaration of the agriculture after uh, economic reforms or post economic reforms and they can be c part of question 2 number 1 neglect of agriculture see guys agriculture was neglected after economic reforms by the government government did not give that much heed to agriculture as it used to give second limited reforms after this period limited reforms were done in the agricultural sector so limited reforms of agriculture then lack of investment not much investment was made in this sector okay so lack of investment then input cost that means the seeds and all fertilizers that were required for agriculture their cost increased so this input cost and the subsidies they were reduced so decline in subsidies and rise in input cost price volatility see guys if someone is investing or if someone is doing any business or job what a, what he or she is expecting they expect an stable return yes or no a stable return is expected but that's not the case with agriculture hmm farmer he invested his money he worked for he and really he worked hard for entire season now at the time of cultivation anything can happen his crops can be destroyed or he may not be able to sell out his crops at a proper rate the rate that will suffice to the efforts made by him and will provide him some profit so that he can take care of himself and his family so all these things are not uh, not certain even after working so hard even after investing money farmer may suffer loss and what why to shell same may mostly they used to suffer losses that's how volatile the scenario of agriculture was okay so when such was the case so what happened farmers started giving up this occupation this paternal occupation of theirs and they most of them they shifted to the labor class they became the laborers okay <clears throat> thereby leading to the declaration land fragmentation ha huh? very important it is land was subdivided and again subdivided between brothers climate change and weather condition which led to the which adversely affected the growth of the crop market access there were not many markets available to the farmers to sell out their produce and the access to the market was very complex market access and price realization okay market access and price realization 
Next is the debt that the farmers were facing. So all these are the different factors. Okay. Clear? Moving on. Next question. Third question A part. So the question is that discuss the role of DR Gadgil in economic planning and development. Very important. Rao has been asked and the second question on Gadgil. Okay. So again an expected question. Just a minute guys. Okay. So it's very much expected question. Very easy. So DR Gadgil that is Dhananjay Ramchandra Gadgil. Fine. So let me write down few points that what you could have written in your answer to score good marks. So this is third question A part. So Dhananjay Ramchandra Gadgil. A very famous economist in India played a significant role in economic planning and development in India. Particularly during early years of independence. So this much introduction is more than sufficient. Now you could highlight the aspects of it that what are the sectors or what are the different things that he did or the phases on which he focused. So that is inclusive growth. So as we know that Gadgil was a big promoter of inclusive growth. Fine. Agree. Then advocacy of balanced growth. Balanced growth that it shouldn't be the case that rich is getting richer and poor is getting poorer. Okay. The growth in the country should be balanced. Everyone should be benefited from the growth of the country. That's what his point of view was. Then, agricultural development. Okay. He also promoted this thing that there should be agricultural development. Then, industrialization and infrastructure. This is a field where he worked for the promotion of industrialized industries and infra then public sector development okay then he paid, he played a major role in third five year plan from 61 to 66 third five year plan fyp Special attention was also laid on human development, land reforms, which he did, and finally, the advocacy of decentralization. 
that center should not hold everything center should not be the major force in the market so we have to decentralize the things so as you can see his contribution was quite big in indian economy understood moving on next question is b part of the third question that explain the role of public sector in the indian economy public sector government companies psus public sector undertakings and pses public sector enterprises also point out its main problems faced during 1970 to 1980 so first of all they are asking us that what was the role of public sector in the growth of indian economy and then they are asking the second part of question is asking that what were the problems major problems faced by this sector okay so first of all you could start your answer by giving a bit of introduction to public sector hmm. so see in this way we could have written that the public sector played a significant role in the indian economy since the independence okay during 1970s and 80s india had mixed economy with public sector being a dominant force so india had mixed eco and public sector was dominating here okay both the sectors coexisted but again public sector was the dominant sector so what all happened here see so first you can write the merits that how this public sector helped in the growth of indian economy so several merits i am writing like industrial development second is strategic industries were also developed or in fact these strategic industries were public sector industries then reduction of regional disparities so see guys these industries it was not like public sector undertakings were developed in a particular region no they were distributed throughout the india depending on the availability of raw materials and land and labor so this led to what it led to the narrowing down of the disparities in the region it was not like that a particular state is favored by the government so all the psus will be located there no so that's what this public sector helped in Hmm. Then you can say, yeah, obviously it provided employment to the huge chunk of our population. Resource mobilization, obviously. The produce of these industries they reached the far-fetched areas of the country. 
तो रिसोर्स मोबिलाइजेशन राइट इंपोर्ट सब्सटीट्यूशन दीज इंडस्ट्रीज दे डेवलप द प्रोडक्ट इवन दो प्रोडक्ट फॉर डेवलप विच आर यूज इन आर डे टू डे लाइफ सो नो नीड टू इंपोर्ट दो प्रोडक्ट राइट सो दिस सर्व एज अ सब्सटीट्यूट फॉर इंपोर्ट getting me so all these are the merits of it now during the phase of 70 and 80 as asked in our question this sector that is psus they face several problems so what were those problems let us illustrate it out also so the problems or the challenges faced during the phase of 70s and 80s so number one is inefficiency of bureaucracy bureaucracy see guys bureaucrats were running these industries and they were taking bribes they were inefficient they were lazy they were not fulfilling the targets so inefficient bureaucracy lack of autonomy these industries were not autonomous government industries for every big and small decision they had to knock the doors of the government take permissions from the officers or from the seniors and all these things they delayed the decision making process and the industries started lagging behind over staffing was also a major issue for a particular task more than required laborers were present over staffing okay then resource constraints low profitability and due to the above mentioned reasons obviously the industry suffered and led to the low profitability in fact most of the industries they were incurring the losses forget about the profit forget about low profit they were incurring the losses getting me so this is more than sufficient for b part of the question moving on c part is saying explain the concept of ceiling on agricultural land holding in india examine its rationality with respect to equity and efficiency okay so see guys first of all they are talking about the concept of ceiling now concept of ceiling it is the law that was presented by the government of india a resolution by government of india according to this what was done was a limit was set on the amount of land an individual or an entity can hold that means a limit was set that an individual cannot own more than this much land if he or she owns the more than this much limit more than the granted limit then his land will be confiscated by the government that extra land okay so that's what the meaning of ceiling is okay then they are asking us examine its rationality how rational it was okay so let's see so it's the c part of the third question so first of all you need to give a bit of introduction about ceiling on agricultural land so ceiling on agricultural land holdings in india refers to the legal restrictions
imposed by the government on the maximum amount of agricultural land that an individual or entity can hold fine this much introduction and what was the idea the idea was to prevent the few individuals or entities from amassing large tract of agricultural land so you can say as to prevent a sort of monopoly in agricultural land okay because few rich few influential they will acquire all the land so again the farmers won't get anything they won't get the land and again they will become agricultural labors so to prevent this thing the sealing system was launched or these laws were made okay now what was the efficiency as the second part is asking so certain points i am writing these points will explain it first of all that it led to reduction of land inequality second is enhanced access for landless for landless and marginalized groups so now these groups could also get land of their own fine encouragement of efficient land use then as i told you prevention of land monopolies so all these were the positive factors or positive impacts of it understood okay please look at it then we'll proceed right let's proceed Hmm. Next question, fourth question. It is saying, explain the main causes of inequality in income distribution in India, and examine how it affects welfare of the society. So the question is asking us that why is there so tremendous difference in income distribution in India? that means why rich are so rich and why few people are so poor that they are not even able to have food twice a day so what what are the main reasons for it why is it is this the case in india that's what the question is asking us okay so again there can be several reasons and answer can be framed but i will list out or give you the main points that were required to be presented in this answer to score good marks huh? okay so this is the a part of fourth question 
इनकम इन इक्वेलिटी इन इंडिया इज अ कॉम्प्लेक्स इशू influenced by a combination of historical comma economic social and policy related factors some of the main causes for income inequality okay so first of all you could have introduced it that what in income inequality means and it is a complex issue in india and it is the combination this issue is the combination of several factors like historical economical social political then you could list out the reasons or the causes some of the causes main causes ha huh? so like number 1 historical legacy then educational disparities historical legacy people who have been exploited from generations all their wealth being looted deprived from the social conditioning deprived from the basic necessities so such families such people they have been facing poverty from the lineage getting my point their fathers forefathers everyone was born and died in poverty so that's what it is historical legacy second is educational disparities a particular section of the society was educated to the core they studied in the universities like oxford cambridge harvard and most of the population they didn't even know what are languages they could not even write their name so such was the case so educational disparities rural urban divide a huge chunk of population was living in villages a small percentage was urbanized this and that's what you say that there were actually two in there even today we can say it but not to the extent as it was in past two indias present inside india one india lived in cities they had all the facilities and amenities at their dispose whereas the major population which i call india two that lived in the rural areas deprived from the basic necessities deprived from the education deprived from the proper source of income okay so rural urban divide then gender inequality male female wealth concentration few people as i discussed earlier also they were super duper rich entire wealth was concentrated to the few lack of access to assets okay informal sector employment and finally economic disparities across the state few states were super rich like maharashtra okay if not not to use the word super rich but then to 
they were well off like maharashtra gujarat and few states like bihar up they were below poverty line so that's the disparity between the states as well these states like maharashtra gujarat they were getting industries they were rich and on top of that they were getting industries and these states like up bihar they were getting step motherly treatment so economic disparities across states fine so these reasons would suffice for our answer clear moving on to the next question b part of the fourth question just a minute guys yeah it is saying describe the pattern and trends in national income in india during the pre economic reform period that how the national income was distributed what was the trend of national income but they are talking about pre economic period that means before 1991 and 1992 again a very easy and straight out question it is okay so see this pre economic reform era this pre economic reform era it can be subdivided into several heads and i will illustrate the features of each and every era hmm? okay after independence from in, or you can say from independence to 1991 and 192 this period can be subdivided so i will illustrate the period and then i will tell you the features of national income in that period okay so first of all post independence era that is 1950s to early 1960s okay guys so what were the features of national income in this era so you can say mixed economy model was followed that means public sector and private sector both were there but public sector was a dominating force second is as i said dominant public sector third is focus industrialization and self sufficiency see guys this is also the aspect of this era that the focus was on inter industrialization and the goods that were produced by industries they were sufficient to meet the demand of the people because people were not that much educated most of the population was living in the rural areas so demand was not that high that is why these industries were able to meet out the requirements or you can say self sufficiency state was there Nas thereby national income growth was stable and modest so stable growth was there in the national income and it was modest too second era we can divide from 1960 to 1970 and this is green revolution era so green revolution
and agricultural growth the period is from 1960 to 1970 so what happened in green revolution high yielding crop varieties high yielding seeds were introduced due to which high yielding crop varieties modern farming techniques were introduced okay irrigation then significant increase in agricultural produce okay then you could list out the economic challenges faced in this era that we have already discussed in the previous questions okay public sector role could also be illustrated from 1950s to 1960s getting me fine then from 1970 to 1980 the performance was mixed not that great not that bad and in the late 1980s government made the reforms in 91 and 92 but in the late 1980s the shift was towards the liberalization shifting process started earlier okay clear so all these are the points moving on next question it says explain the development of cotton industry in india during pre independence era also point out its growth constraints so we have to illustrate the features of cotton industry development okay pre independence era So see, this is C part. So development of cotton industry. So first of all, the historical. I am writing several aspects. These aspects could be briefed out. Historical significance here. You can tell. that in india before britishers even there were certain handloom industries and also cotton industry had historical relevance second is handloom tradition third is domestic and international demand demand for cotton was present domestically as well as internationally then artisan skills in india they were also responsible for the development of cotton industries raw material was easily available fine guys so these are the several aspects which led to the growth of cotton industries then it asks you that what were the growth constraints what were the problems that were hindering the growth so technological constraints were there indian industry or india was not that developed in the field of technology and britishers never paid attention to that part lack of capital as i said no banking authority was there to finance competition from imported goods britishers used india as a market 
they took the raw materials from india made the goods in their country and then again sent the goods to india right to earn profits so the competition from those goods <clears throat> exploitative practices were prevalent at that time britishers adopted exploitative practice then is the their policies colonial policies market access was not there and then indians were not even educated so low literary and education so all these were the constraints fine moving on next question so fifth question a part it is saying distinguish between explicit and implicit subsidies explain the trends in explicit subsidies on irrigation and fertilizer in india during post economic reform period okay so first of all difference between explicit and implicit subsidies so see first of all explicit is a direct subsidy okay it is quite open direct it is direct and identifiable financial transfers or assistances this is indirect forms of support provided by government right so as i said explicit is direct implicit is indirect second is these are transparent and easily traceable you can trace that okay under this section i am getting subsidy these are not as transparent as explicit and not clearly accounted in our budget so a special segmentization in budget is not done for implicit not clearly accounted for in budget third targeted to benefit a specific group okay so these type of explicit subsidies are given for a particular group the targeted group or sectors so specific group or sectors are targeted whereas implicit are indirect benefits such as lower prices for consumers or increased income fine then you can give examples so in case of explicit you can say food subsidies fuel subsidies
hmm, etc. In case of implicit, you can say, for example, preferential interest rate. for agriculture or msme sector hmm, all these things understood now what's the impact of this explicit on irrigation so certain points i'm writing these are the impacts like irrigation subsidy was given irrigation subsidy then after and this was given post economic reforms okay then fertilizer subsidy was also given right fine moving on Next question, it is saying, examine the salient features of action plan for disinvestment 2009. That means, what were the features of the action plan of disinvestment that disinvestment has to be done? So what were the features for it of 2009? So see, first of all, give a bit of introduction that what this investment means that government withdraws its holdings right from several psus and all thereby government gets the money and private participation can be increased in the market so that's why this is done this investment so you can write significant policy investment policy initiative aimed at raising funds for the government by selling minority stakes of the government in PSEs, public sector enterprises. What are these? Number one. Selective disinvestment. Revenue generation, improving corporate governance, listing on stock exchange. So, listing on stock exchange, see, PSUs or PSEs are listed in stock exchange. Now, what government did was it sold its stake. So what happened? Private investors, retail investors, they even got the opportunity to buy these stakes. Listing on stock exchange. Real participation. Then fund utilization. So all these are the aspects, fine, moving on. Next is, what do you mean by horizontal physical disequilibrium? So horizontal imbalance it is talking about. In a federal setup and how did the 12th finance commission correct such imbalance in India? So see, horizontal imbalance means disparities amongst the state right that some state is more rich it is getting uh, more uh, financial resources another state is uh, poorer in comparison okay 
it is not able to avail that many economic resources but both these states have got same amount of responsibilities so this is a disparity na horizontal imbalance it is and this is encountered two types of imbalances vertical and horizontal horizontal represents the disparity between states and vertical imbalance represents disparity between center and state okay here it is talking about horizontal imbalance so see first of all describe the situation and then we can tell the steps taken okay so it refers to the situation where there is disparity or imbalance in the fiscal capacity and financial resources of different states or regions okay within a country okay as i said now what are the steps taken number 1 tax devaluation number 2 grants in aid these are the steps taken by the 12th finance commission third fiscal discipline fourth state specific consideration states which are lagging behind they were given a special consideration enhanced autonomy incentivizing the performance promotion of local government sectoral allocations okay so these are the several steps taken by the wealth finance commission moving on next question d part it is saying show how lf that is liquidity adjustment facility now what is lf the crr slr right these are the tools of central bank okay in india emerged as an effective monetary policy instrument to control market fluctuations in the short run so it is asking you that how crr and L, slr it emerged as a as an important tool okay by which central bank can uh, coordinate or control the market fluctuations so a bit of introduction of lf and then you can illustrate its effectiveness by the several aspects see you can say that lf it emerged as effective monetary policy instrument
okay to control market fluctuations in the short run and manage liquidity in banking system fine now you can tell that how it is used that what is crr cash reserve ratio you can tell that what is crr cash reserve ratio then slr that is statutory liquid ratio that means the money that is deposited in bank bank has to hold certain ratio of that it in form of cash and in slr it can hold it in form of gold cash or gsec that is government securities then you can also tell about inflationary and deflationary policy that in inflation what will what will central bank do it will increase the rate of crr and slr thereby banks will not have enough funds to lend out now bank have got their own expenditure to meet out thereby they will lend the limited funds at higher rate of interest so what will happen people will shrink away they will not take the loans and hence when people won't take loan they won't purchase so the demand in market will decline as demand will decline prices of the goods and services will decline thereby countering the inflation and just the opposite will happen in case of deflation so all these explanations can be given and it is more than sufficient fine moving on next question e part it is saying examine the effectiveness of universal basic income as an approach to poverty alleviation in india universal basic income what is see first understand the concept of universal basic income <coughs> so e part it is talking about universal basic income ubi see what is the meaning of ubi ubi means that government of let's talk in terms of india because the paper is of indian economy so in ubi what happens is that government is going to give money to all its citizens irrespective of the fact of their social status their income their caste creed religion anything citizen means citizen and the citizen will get this income from the government uh, amount will be decided and that amount will be transferred to each and every citizen of india whether he is mukesh ambani or whether he is someone who is deprived everyone will get same amount of money that's the concept of ubi okay right so that's what it is now how it can help in poverty alleviation alleviation means crushing the poverty removing the poverty so there are certain points the advantages you can illustrate the advantages and the challenges so first i am writing the advantages like see you if for the countries like india if you do not want to give it to everyone to each and every citizen then targeting can be done that these many people do need it and they can get the benefit so like targeting the beneficiaries second is reduction of extreme poverty this can help in reduction of extreme poverty then simplicity and efficiency next is it can be the economic stimulus economy can rise next is gender empowerment now when women will also get the money 
so they will also be free to use it according to their own will so they'll get empowered this will result in gender empowerment fine but again there are several challenges it's that's why it has not been launched as of now it's a complex issue so first is financial viability <clears throat> for a developing country like india we first of all have to see that whether this scheme is financially viable to us or not can we afford it can we counter that much rate of inflation second is as i said inflationary pressures inflation will rise to skies it will skyrocket fiscal discipline has also to be considered then effect on labor market adverse impact because people won't go to work when they are getting the money so why would they work effect on labor market so labor market will be affected so all these are the challenges or the negatives about it fine moving on next question sixth question it is saying discuss the characteristic features of aoa that is agreement on agriculture under uruguay round of gat and examine its impact on indian agriculture expected question it is so see sixth question so first of all you can describe or introduce bit of aoa that aoa introduced several important features and what was it aim its aim was liberalizing global agriculture trade and regulating agricultural policies okay this must this much interest more than sufficient then you can tell the main impact of it on indian agriculture like impact in impact you can talk about number 1 market access two export subsidies <clears throat> right then domestic support like your green box blue box amber box then special and differential treatment so all these steps and a bit of description fine clear moving on next question is state the key features of targeted public distribution system tpds in india do you believe that tpds has been successful in achieving its objective and justification is asked <clears throat> so what is tpds first of all introduce it then we will talk about the second part so tpds it is a government run run by government food security program okay and what is its aim its aim is providing subsidized food grains to eligible beneficiaries
and basically low income household <clears throat> the key features are <clears throat> first of all the identification of beneficiaries so that deserving can get the benefit identification then distribution of the commodities then central and state responsibility both central government and state government they together handle this for see in india during the period of corona this thing started and it is it has been applicable till now so yeah it is success that the distribution of the grains then the issue price then the shops fair price shops where these grains can be availed okay digitalization and transparency fine aadhar integration all these things all these aspects you can write fine moving on next question state the selling features of foreign exchange management fema which was launched in 1999 in india and how it is different from fera of 1979 okay so guys we have time constraint so i'll do this last question two questions will be left seven and eight that we will discuss on some other day fine so salient features of fema first is liberalization the fema is more liberalized and simplified simplification second is current account transparency and distinction also current account transactions are handled separately and capital account transactions are handled separately authorized persons penalties are there compounding offenses then it regulates foreign exchange market and exchanges central authorities so all these things how is it different so distinction from fera number 1 shift from see under fera the offenses were mostly criminal so the shift is done in fema from criminal to civil offenses shift from criminal to civil then current versus capital distinction is made now okay then there are penalties so all these are the changes okay so that's it for today guys two questions we will discuss some other day i hope the session was helpful for you hmm? cleared out your and it helped you to clear your doubts and gave you an insight that in what way you had to present your answers and what were the important features of it so thank you take care bye bye